right, let's go back into our first Timothy passage here. We're going to slowly make our way through these verses now that we kind of look at the whole thing overall. We'll just start with the first couple of verses that we'll talk about for a minute. First Timothy 1, once again, this is the reading. It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, according to the commandment of God, our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, who lives our hope, the Timothy, a true child of the faith, great mercy, and peace from God the Father, Christ Jesus. And this sounds like a pretty typical reading from Paul, if you know any of the letters that he wrote, but there's still a lot in there that we just got to talk about for a minute. So already from this reading, it tells us a lot about this letter. So it's kind of been written by Paul. It tells us who it was written to, to this early day, Timothy. And it tells us, uh, well, a little bit about uh, what is happening here. Timothy had the responsibility of overseeing the work of the Ephesian church after Paul went on to that today. So this letter works as a great leadership manual for church operation, organization, administration. In this book, we get instruction on worship, qualifications for overseers and deacons, instructions on how to treat different people in the church, commands on what to teach on, and more than that. So, the more that I learn about Ephesus during this time, the more it reminds me a little bit of present day America. In the way that Ephesus was a place with a sinful environment, it was also a place where false teaching was a problem. Paul didn't tell Timothy to flee such a place. He said to remain there and be about kingdom work. You know, I'm sure that there are other places and were other times where kingdom teaching was easier than it is right here and right now. But perhaps as time goes on, being a Christian here is going to become a lot harder. But that just means that the church needs kingdom work to be done. So we shouldn't just fall to the same so if you see here that Paul left Timothy behind to probably was a job for him to do, and it was not an easy job. It likely wasn't an easy pardon between two things. It's obvious that Paul thought very highly of Timothy, and that he had affectionate feelings for him after Timothy left. In his greeting, he called Timothy uh, his child, or in some translations, Translations of the Bible, he called it his true son in the faith. Now, perhaps this seems a little odd to you, since we know that every Christian is a sibling. We are children of God, and therefore brothers and sisters in the faith. So, what does Paul mean when he calls Timothy his son in the faith? Well, this would simply be Paul's way of saying that he was the one who led Timothy to the faith. But there was more to this relationship than just a Christian leader and his son. There are other places in the Bible that use this father child imagery. The phrase spiritual father is not found in the Bible, but there are passages that imply a form of spiritual fatherhood that can be committed to the over mercy. Peter called Mark his son in 1 Peter 5 13. In Philemon 1 10, this verse appears in the bulletin on the main page, but there's something not there. Paul says, I appeal to you for my child, and this is whose father I became in my imprisonment. And also, we know that both John and Paul refer to whole congregations in Acts 1 Timothy. These apostles would take on a sort of fatherly role in the life of the young Christians. Now, perhaps a better word than father would be shepherd which is how we think of pastors today. It is the job of the shepherd to lead, teach, disciple, and mentor younger believers in the faith. Now, while pastors specifically have a job of shepherding, Jesus has commanded us all to take on the job of disciples. Now, this involves creating spiritual relationships that in some ways resemble father, son, and mother, daughter relationships. In the book of Titus, there's a specific uh, passage where we see instructions for older women to teach to mentor younger women, not unlike what a mother or a grandmother would do. And then we have Paul and Timothy. Paul had disciples Timothy and is now separated from them and instructing him with good responsibility. So after it felt similar to sending your child out to the world for the first time, I wonder if Paul was nervous about instructing Timothy with such a big responsibility. So 
Well, think of it like this. Let's suppose you spend your time on the time that you were accepted all the time. It doesn't mean that you stop to see it or die from it. It doesn't mean that you stop thinking about the same thing. Likewise, even though Paul is in this country to get separated here, we see as the disciples here that the first word of God has not stopped. It's the letter of Timothy that we see to where they are. Having myself worked as you said to the future, I'm often asked myself this question. What does a Christian do to find himself? Think about that question. How would you answer that question? I think in the assignment of the church today, I think it's first like in a lot of ways to be summed up as people getting together for a teaching session. And then departing back to their very separate lives and so they have to teach each other. I think what we need more of is spiritual relationships, not unlike what we see in the Spiritual relationships are hard, maybe because we live in such a place in spiritual world where we don't even see the talk about the Christian. We don't even see the conversation. We don't even say something to them. Or perhaps our faith is too personal to talk about with somebody, or too personal to share with somebody in public. I admit that when I talk about my spiritual life with someone, it sometimes feels like I'm oversharing. I uh, share his private information with them. You know, our faith is a very personal thing, but it isn't meant to be kept private. There's too much in Scripture about sharing our faith to believe it's okay to be private on things that we're talking about. God has given all of us a testament. We're to share it. Why? The relationship for this work. So they should use that to make that better. Now, you think it's my position to person that you should use to have spiritual conversations with people, but I found this still very tough. I've been in conversations with young people before where they came to me, you know, with their problems, seeking some help or advice, and they didn't want to share with me. So sometimes it'll seem like the moment I started steering the conversation to a spiritual connection, it just turned out. It's like they only wanted some practical advice on some spiritual connection. But I would say spiritual guidance is very practical advice. Too often we want to preach the symptoms of a problem rather than really get at the root causes of the problem, which most of the time is spiritual. You know, the world tends to make us worldly, just living in bed like this, to make our lives unspiritual in how we think. I think that's why we don't pray more than we do. I think that's why we don't read the Bible more than we do. It's why many believers don't bother the church. It's why we don't have more spiritual conversations with people. It's just not something that Paul is writing about. I think too many believers spend their lives just trying to get deep with what we're called to do in the life of a Christian. Let me ask you this question. Do you think spiritual conversations are a responsibility to have with people? I would say no, and the reason I say that is because they live with such purpose. They live knowing they were on a mission. Think about it. It would be crazy for people on a mission to never talk about the mission that they're trying to accomplish. So if, if our conversations are never spiritual, it should be a sign that our lives are greater than we think they are. So some people might feel like they're, they're doing pretty good because they sometimes talk about God when they occur from something. But if we're living like we're on a mission every single day and talking about spiritual things, then we are doing it. How often do you have spiritual conversations with your friends, with your children, with your spouse, your parents, your friends, or even with strangers that you would never in a million times about? You know, I've recently realized that my kids are at the age where I need to start praying with them and not just for them because they're watching me. I started talking to Emily just for them about God, and she's got some pretty great questions that I don't know how to answer to a six-year-old. But she's smart. But what does it say to a child or to me when we never talk about spiritual things? Really, it says that it's not very important to us how they're dressed or how they're talking about their dresses or their their dresses being in church. I've heard my dad talk about it. Y'all probably heard talk about it too at some point. He used to go to an old Taco Bell where he said if you walk in the building, you heard a spiritual conversation about it. We were talking about what God was doing in the church and how we can step out. But sadly, this isn't the normal case. Most of the time, when you walk into a church on Sunday morning, what you hear is people talking about the 
be a ball game or the weather, or even worse, maybe they're not even talking at all. But I get it. I like their rhythm. I think we like to take a conversation. You know, especially as guys, we like to keep a fight. We don't want to get too deep with each other. We, we might need a guy to remind ourselves that it's not unmanly to talk about how God has come to the heart of the It's not a weakness to ask the faith. There are a lot of young men who say that to be a spiritual and a spiritual part of the And I think it might be true that these younger generations aren't so good at that. I think what they like is deeper than their conversations. So that means we should be scared to have these conversations with I think if you went to someone and tried to have a serious conversation, I don't think you would get rejected nearly as often as you would get rejected. Because they're like the church. They're not afraid of being rejected. And they want to talk about their stuff. Before we move on to the passage, I'd like to take a look at another passage that's in the class on study. It's in the book of Deuteronomy. If you look back in the bulletin, it says Matthew 23. We see here that Jesus is instructing the crowd and giving the people of the church to act like fathers and teachers for the sake of their children. Let's read that. Matthew 23, verses 20 and 21. Jesus is saying that you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher. You are all brothers. And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father who is in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant, for those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be humbled. That's kind of a tough passage when you take it out of context. How many people in here have ever called your father your father for the sake? How many of you ever called your teacher your teacher? So, does this, what Jesus is speaking here, does it, does it mean that Paul's name, whatever he called Timothy, was the same as something that they were going to call and some of the fathers were going to him? So when he disobeyed Jesus' command to, to not use titles for the people, let's get into it. For starters, how does he call Ashley to be called Father by Jesus? He calls himself a father to some, but at another place he also calls himself the chief saint. And that doesn't mean he wants others to refer to him as chief saint. So nowhere are any of the apostles addressed as father by the name of Jesus. Think about uh, in the Catholic Church. What do they call priests? Father. Think about what the word Pope even takes from the title that we use, Father. You know, the Bible doesn't tell us to do that, so that seems to be one of the good things to have. So, you know, I've wondered before, uh, I don't know if y'all know, but I know my dad goes to Christ to be called Jesse. Anytime it happens, it just seems like it makes more sense to me. And I asked about it one time, and he says it's because of this passage in Matthew 23 with Jesus and warning against religious titles like that. Why does Jesus warn us about that? Because there is often pride that comes with time. It's not unlikely that someone with a high religious title might believe that they are above some people. In Matthew 23, Jesus makes the mistake of Peter that all Christians are brothers and sisters. Right? We are equal. When we get more context in Matthew 23, it becomes clear what Jesus is teaching in regards to religious titles. So let's go back there to the next uh, passage in the bulletin. He's speaking to his disciples there to the make his class of seven, or the one before they can say that to one of them. He says, Everything they do is done for people to see. They make their phylacteries wide and their tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honor and they do it in the most important seats to make them proud. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplace and to be called Rabbi by everyone. These guys and Pharisees were eaten of the crowd. Jesus was calling them out. They loved their prestigious titles and their seats of honor. They loved to show off and they wanted others to look up to them. As their superior. They wanted you to know that they were better than you, and so they told them. So Jesus warned this crowd not to be guilty of the sin of these self righteous, egotistical hypocrites, as Jesus called them. He's telling these people that they shouldn't see egos or seek to play with titles like father, rabbi, or even instructor, as he says to them. So when Paul and Peter 
refer to themselves as a father is very different from what you describe the Pharisees were doing in their history. The latter sought to exalt themselves in verses 11 and 12 of that to about those who exalt themselves to the Father. So believers, believers are told do not call anyone Father because anyone who is the Father is the Father. I think a lot of people alive today are more advocates of the fact that God is the good thing. You know, one big way for us to stop the abuses of the standards of society and the faith is called God. Which just so happens to be a main reason that Paul wrote for leaving the God. Let's continue with our first Timothy chapter, verses 3 and 4. He says, as I urged you upon my departure from Macedonia, the main on Ephesus, so, so <coughs> excuse me, you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrine, nor to pay attention to myths and superstitions, which give rise to mere speculation rather than further the administration of God. So I said before that Timothy was left behind in the crowd in one of the How many of you like how this is directed? that Timothy had to do. He had to express his false teaching that was said to come into church teaching. This is another reminder that doctrine is in fact a big deal. But some churches have the mentality, mentality that doctrine is not all that important and not necessarily love it, that they that they care about. And yet, we are competitive to love teaching, but we're also competitive to not being allowed to false teaching to spread doctrine. You know, God does not contradict contradiction. So therefore, it's not a contradiction to love people, but he also cannot the doctrine at the same time. Either one without the other becomes a problem. Holding to biblical truth but being hateful is a problem. And being loving but not holding to biblical truth is also a problem. It's, it is important that we have both. So Paul left that the Ephesian church was given to the people of the which he had to see the Ephesian church of the And he was concerned that Timothy did everything he could to make sure the Ephesians continued in that doctrine. You know, this modern world struggles in this area because they love to punish. They love to be progressive. They love change and different and whatever is new and pushes boundaries. So when we give them the consistent word of God, and they realize how old it is, how much change it is. They see it as outdated and problematic. You know, if it's not changing with the time, they don't want it. But it's crazy to them that while the world around us continues to progress in technology, health, information, and many other areas, we hold firm to teaching to not love or evolve in the time. Can't help but do that. But the only thing that can be done is to keep it up to the point of where we should be able to be outdated because it's outside of time itself. Look at Psalm 90, verse 4. It says, Your bulletin. It says, For a thousand years, the new signs shall not be able to bear. The sun shall not be able to pour as the water of the sea. God speaks in all of the things past and the things in the future. And we can't even see it. We don't even know if our hearts are going to be good today. But we think that we've got a better way for today's time than what God has written to say to us. So Paul is telling Timothy to tell the church in Ephesus to stick with the teaching of the scriptures. Likewise, the message for the church today is stick with the teaching that God has given us. God wrote them all the time. I would say that he said this, uh, I'm not going to quote the lyrics in here, we have this to say about the teaching that I give that I'm talking about the teaching of Scripture, that's contrary to the teaching of Scripture. He said, new thought is that, but really there are no new heresies, only heresies dressed up and recaptured for a new generation. So new and innovative thinking isn't so new and so later after all. So let's stick with what is current. What is current? The 
This passage in First Timothy gives us a good sign to see this in how the Bible teaches that Timothy is the son. What does Paul say? He refers to the teaching as this in English reality. Some believe that this is referring to the apostasy, which was a common culture of confusing teaching in Jewish society. We also get the sense that this problematic devotion to this and theology is like a silly distraction. There's a saying we've all heard. Keep the main thing, the main thing. That's right. So I'm not saying by that that we shouldn't be good deep in the God's world and not good deep in the things of the world. But we also shouldn't become like food to get in for wild speculations that serve no purpose but to keep us distracted from the real world. We should be about, as the most can say, we should be about what promotes God's work in the church of the church. The next verse kind of gives us what it means to have the church of the church. We go back to verses 5 to 7 of the church. But the goal of our instruction is love, love of your heart, with a good conscience, and no conscience. For some men strain to the center of the practice of truth and sincerity. Wanting to be teachers of the law, even though they can't understand the effect of the saying or the knowledge about which they have such confidence in themselves. What does knowledge tend to do? What does the Bible say? It has a tendency to puff up. The spending time in God's Word does not produce love from a pure heart and no conscience or a sincere faith in it, but something is wrong. Legalism can make it switch God's Word. You know, people can know a lot of the content of the Bible and they still not keep it. They can use the Bible in a way that promotes sin and the suppression of their teaching. Some may approach the Bible for a political or a sentimental purpose, but we should approach the Word of God for the truth of the truth of the Once again, verse 5 says, The goal of the church is love, but some from your heart and your conscience and no conscience. Verse 6 tells us that some have departed from this thing. Talk. And when you stop and think about it, I think there's a lot of secret talk in some of the things that we do today. I think there's a lot that's probably more from there than it comes from God's word than a lot of churches. So verse 5 gives, gives us a good model for a good teaching written in this book. We can see three sort of tests here. So let's look at them real quick. First, that the teaching should come from love and a pure heart. So it's when the teacher's motivation is right. Their intentions are pure. They genuinely desire to share the truth for the benefit of the teacher or student. They're not seeking self glorification or popularity or whatever else one might achieve through preaching and teaching their well known and sincere thoughts. Secondly, the teaching needs to come from a good conscience. Good conscience seeks to show Christ in the of the kingdom. A good conscience doesn't exist for that, it doesn't choose what it is. It's aware of the true. Earth. And then thirdly, good teaching must be accompanied by a sincere faith. The true faith refers to a genuine faith in God's word. It also needs to be complemented by a good conscience. So the false teachers that Paul is going to talk about have two sets. He says they don't even know what they're talking about or what they think confidence comes from. So affirming something confidently can be persuasive, but confidence alone is not biblical truth. If you ever listen to a political speech, they're easy with confidence. Are they easy with truth? <laughs> Just because they're confident doesn't mean it's always true. I mean, they saw it happening with this thing too, and people are saying things confidently, but they don't think it's the truth. So if Paul's teaching in this letter, we are to cling to God's word and avoid the confusion that comes from this and endless genealogy, so to speak. That is, teaching that come from outside of Scripture but aren't supported by Scripture that just confuse us and get us distracted from what we are actually supposed to be about. Let's look back to First Timothy. Let's see verses 8 to 11 now. For we know that the law is wicked if one uses it lawfully for the conversion of those who are profitable. Realizing the fact that law is not made for a righteous person but for those who are lawless and rebellious, for your dog and the sinner, 
What do we do here? We get quite a list of things. What is Paul's purpose in listing all of those things in this text? Well, he says that there is a proper way to do that, which is to The improper way would be to use it as a means for the self The law wasn't given to the righteous, it was given to sinners and lawbreakers so that they may see their need for repentance. The lawbreaker and the rebel do something to show them that they have a problem. Just like sometimes we need a doctor to tell us we have a problem. So how many times has the word of God said it to us that we were wrong about something? One of the ways that this word But it's easy to read the list of sinners with a forgiveness passage. Not. But Paul didn't write this passage, passage so we would have a list of people to judge and discuss. He wrote it because people were improperly keeping the law, which is given so that those who follow their sins might be told to do that. That's why it's so important to hold to the gospel of the There are believers who think they can be more about the people are so prone to see that they are better than God, such as when they ask them to have better sentence than we do. I guess they're scared that the law might scare lost people away when it's actually the law that sets people wanting to do them. They tell you to do them. So in this passage, we see a connection to the people between sound doctrine. So why would you get rid of the doctrine 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 of the being a legalist. Having standards and keeping them does not make us legalists or obedient to the things of God. We are legalists when we think what we do is what makes us right before God. So I would say don't be sorry for their unacceptance if they are not accepted. When you hold them, just be careful. Just be careful not to be like the Christ of Pharisees who did a battle in Matthew 23, who we know like to make rules and then force them on other people to say that that's the point of the world. Look at the verses 12 through 17. I'll go to the first six to that section. It says, I thank the Christ Jesus our Lord, who has blessed us by keeping faith and faith and faith and faith. Even though I was formerly a black and white and 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 a black the grace of our Lord was more than something to be saved from the perfection of the It is a trustworthy statement to know the full acceptance that Christ Jesus took into the world to save us from our sins, and who are the full grace of God. Yet for this reason I felt mercy, so that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example to those who would receive him to the faith. Now to the truth of God. This passage is an interesting contrast between Philippians chapter 3, verses 3 and 16. Let me take them out of chapter 2 and see what they have to say about them. In Philippians, he says, Though I myself have reasons for such confidence, someone else thinks they have reasons for confidence in the flesh, I have some. And then Paul talks about it. And he talks about why he to keep something that he has confidence in the flesh. He says, Such a title of this day of the people of Israel, I would think that the Hebrew of Hebrew, in regard to the law, in order to be righteous, is to be persecuted for the sake of righteousness, 
based on the law, followed. So get this, in one passage, Paul says he was followed. He was like the best religion. And in the other passage, he says he was also the worst. Isn't that crazy to think about? You can be the best religious person, seemingly doing all the right things, but at the same time, be the worst person. I think that says a lot about the gospel, the salvation, how it works, what it is. It tells us that, that it's a lot different than how we like to try to convince people about how we were saved. So how many people are accepting the uh, religion of Christ? And on the other side of that, how many people think that people are not? So whether you think you're the best or you think you're the worst, what you're doing is the same. It is the same thing. You look at yourself and you see what you're doing. So Paul is a picture. He's a picture of hope. To the self-righteous, religious person trusting in his character of grace. And to the sinner who thinks they can't be saved because they're too successful. Either one of these people can be saved. The religious person must stop trusting in his righteousness, which are a pretty rash before God, but it can instead be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. And the heathen must stop his rebellion and turn to God in repentance and likewise be clothed with the righteousness. So as I wrap up today, I'll remind us of the different things that we uh, talk about. We talk about religious security. We talk about false teaching. We talk about proper views and understanding of the law. We talk about God's grace and mercy and how we have to be able to save the world from sin. And yet, all of these different things we talk about are connected. These false teachers certainly felt that they were being persecuted. And they certainly didn't understand the peace of all problems. But they certainly could still be saved by Paul's grace. And he was a black teacher who was saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. Because, as our cover verse says, it's sort of a cover board thing, it says that Christ came into the world to save sinners. And the good news is, we all fall apart. If anyone says they are without sin, they will see the Now everyone falls in one of two categories. You are either lost and separated, or you are saved and saved. This morning, if you are lost and separated from God because of your sin, there is forgiveness and sin. There is mercy and hope for faith in Jesus Christ. And if you are saved and saved, Give thanks to God. Because we only love Him because He saved us. So I think Christian ought to be doing here even though the pastor did it. And before we take out, let me pray over the last portion. Heavenly Father, I thank you again for this morning. Thank you for praying that you would come by and speak to us. We pray this in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of God, Jesus Christ, we p